The aim of this paper is to investigate the delicate journey through the infernal dynamics gravitating around the theme of alienation as our original relationship with the other, described in the 1943 masterpiece Being a Nothingness, and the possibility mentioned and abandoned, but which may well have never been forgotten, of inaugurating a new way of being in the world and with the other, as illustrated in Notebooks for an Ethics, 1947-1948, only published after the author's death. Being a nothingness concludes with the promise to develop an ethics which would authentic enough to be able to redeem the useless passion of the for itself, desperate to become in itself for itself. Regarding the infernal dynamics of conflict, which seem to present themselves as our destiny, Sartre wishes to propose an alternative. A non-dialectic but deliberate, carefully chosen and hard word option that could save the authentic for itself from the conflict of consciousnesses. In Being a Nothingness, the theme of alienation develops from the look that Hegel had previously identified as the main driver of objectification. For Sartre, however, this dynamic hinges not so much on the clash of self-consciousnesses, but primarily on relationships between bodies. Being viewed means that the one's transcendence is transcended, in the sense that one's ability to overcome reality and to freely promote one's personal ends can in turn be overcome, ignored, and deliberately rejected by others. Whichever side of the hierarchical debate we look at in relation to objectification, whether the other is an object or the object that I am for the other, what we have is a meeting between bodies. We cannot talk about a relational dialectic, but rather about a vicious circle when at whose opposing poles we find on the one side love and masochism, and on the other indifference, sadism, and hatred. In both cases, the conflict gives birth to the original meaning of the being for others. Already in his description of love, we can perceive a deeply rooted contradiction. Love is presented as the illusion that for itself conjures up to justify its existence. It seems to give back a fullness of meaning, but in reality, it is only the umpteenth way of looking for an escape route and bad faith. In fact, with this demand for appropriation, we want to be loved by freedom and simultaneously expect this freedom not to be free and to imprison itself with its own means. As we will see in his notebooks, Sartre will contrast the lo this love psyche with a love tension or love as a venture, welling from the self-aware knowledge of one's own condition of absolute unjustifiability, gratuitousness and finitude. Love, however, is a project destined for failure, which by no means resolves the problem of the being for others and reconfigures itself into a project leading to alienation. In this part of his work, Sartre studies the intertwining of relational dynamics with sexuality in death, without considering sexuality as a secondary phenomenon, but as an original modality of the being for others. This is because, quote, the being which desires is consciousness making itself body, end of quote. To Sartre, it is very clear that alienation involves freedom in the form of corporeality, because the conflicting attempts at submission and, and objectification in desire to become flesh, to take possession of the flesh of the other, are played out on the contingent side of freedom in the psyche in situation. The same alienating structures here described as masochism or sadism will be dealt with again in the notebooks, albeit in a wider ranging context to account for violence and oppression as historical ontolo historical ontological modalities. Even in Notebooks for an Ethics, where Sartre expresses a positive possibility to overcome our infernal dynamics, the prevailing content, at least from a quantitative point of view, comprises descriptions of the body being alienated and objectified, compared with just a few pages devoted to its potential redemption. Also in the notebooks where the phenomenological analysis enriched by the complex pseudo-dialectical dynamics of history, within which ontological alienation assumes concrete form in an ethics of force, this is principally expressed by violence in its daily guise, oppression. Sartre analyzes violence as ontological behavior towards freedom embodied in all its different forms, from the most evident to the most hidden. Violence is presented as a bad faith reaction to alienation itself, and in this destruction, what is damaged, symbolically speaking, is the look of the other, as it is reduced to mere corporeal density. The for itself exercising violence acts in bad faith because it does not accept the shifting nature inherent to the for itself. It rejects being freedom in situation and its own facticity. <laughs> 
almost as if arising from an unconfessable Nietzschean critical setting, for Sartre it is the spirit of seriousness that perpetuates violence through transcendent values, imposing an objective obligation, the heteronomous guide for any individual act. These mystifications in our relationship with our own for itself, personal ends and personal projects become, once again, attempts to escape from the anxiety of perceiving ourselves as the unjustifiable basis for our personal actions. The nihilistic destruction of the violent is thus the rejection of the process of nullification of freedom. The meanings are hereby established once and for all, and the end needs to be pursued with any means, without compromise, and most of all without any kind of dialogue or interaction with the real situation. Such conduct, which in truth reduces freedom as it confines to preconstituted tracks chosen once and for all, will only result in a failure. The ethics of force deriving from the ontological behavior of violence is the establishment of hell in the fight between incarnate consciousnesses, in other worlds between bodies, and sees the pure and formal exercise of its own will or abdication of its own personal freedom as the only possible alternatives. For Sartre, any act of manipulation, deceit or falsehood leads to the limitation of the freedom of the other, who is impeded from obtaining a firm grasp of reality. Indeed, if a freedom that is ontologically absolute and radical has not been able to exercise historically nor tangibly change a real situation into an ideal situation, it hides itself or is talked away as destiny, in the sense that the same freedom becomes perceived within a framework of natural and inescapable determinism. For such, the oppressor is first and foremost oppressed, and could not oppress others in turn had they not acted as an accomplice to oppression in the beginning. This oppression does not necessarily have to derive from an individual other or specific social group, but may also derive from duty, which ranks freedom below determinism. Even obligation as a request made to the other is not an exit route from the infernal universe of violence. On the contrary, in the pages Sartre dedicated to the obligation, he makes his most refined critique of the categorical imperative and the you must therefore you can, which constitutes the foundations and guarantee of freedom in Kant's critique of practical reason. The categorical imperative becomes interpreted as an unconditional device which is incapable of interrogating its historical context. It is, quote, the presence of the other's freedom as a transcendence internalized into my own freedom, its origin is in the look, end of quote. For Sartre, if the ratio conoscendi of freedom is effectively duty, in the place of freedom as a choice in situation, we are left with a freedom that is a choice already made outside of any situation. Duty is therefore the internalization of the other's violence, where the other, whether it be a physical or abstract entity, takes no account of situation, project, time, or means. Here, Sartre broaches the distinction between the undiscerning adoption of a universal objective obligation and the values have to be. In both cases, it would seem to be a duty demanding the adoption of a series of means for its fulfillment. With obligation, the end is crystallized and imposed upon the other in a heteronomous way, but it is nonetheless possible to imagine an alternative where the for itself recognizes how deeply it is conditioned by the situation and by existential and historical developments. The mystification Sartre had already broken down was that of taking value as obligation. Value is not a recognizable essence, but rather, distancing itself from mainstream phenomenological thought, a subjective lack that is not in the way of the have to be, that is something that must be fulfilled within the framework of a project. Value is for Sartre the opposite of an unmoving star. We should instead imagine it as a subjective correlative of a fragile and temporary conditioned end. It is sustained by the subject's freedom, and in this it must distinguish itself from obligation, which nonetheless remains even when we distance ourselves from it. We surpass ourselves, striving the end and value we lack, where obligation intersects with and transcends us as a subject. If the end which is with its correlative entity value is in front, as a future venture that must be carried out in the way it might well not be, the spirit of seriousness conjures up a mystification where obligation arrives from behind freedom. If we follow the linear progress of the notebooks, we may be tempted to affirm that the pages dedicated to the overcoming the ethics of force are a simple counter-right and descriptive, descriptive alternative to violence. 
Nevertheless, the aim of this paper is to mark out a potential normative track whilst respecting the effective ambiguity of the text. If obligation and duty make up the attitude belonging to violence, a way out could be provided by value, although it does not contain in itself a normative motor that would make it the preferred option. Let us then try to better and more accurately frame Sartre's proposed moral by examining the pages where Sartre speaks of the possibility of breaking the vicious circle of alienation. Sartre identifies moral conversion in alternative to the ethics of violence, which is primarily characterized as a refusal of the desire to become in itself for itself. With the moral conversion, a renunciation of personal foundations a priori through the utopia of a stable identity, we can inaugurate a new conscious way of being in the face of, our, of one's own self, which is immune to the mystifications of bad faith. To do this, the for itself must renounce the seductions of the psychic of, and any idea of character. Sartre wants to undo the radical failure of psychological life in that one's own character is like the objectified ghost of the other. Only the other is granted the ability to judge my conduct and make me an object of the world, even because the for itself may never identify with its conduct, if not in point of death. If a subject abandons its own ego and the fact of founding himself on a supposed right at all costs, even the dynamics with others may break free of the vicious circle of mutual objectification. Leaving behind the mythology of the hands causa sui, the for itself recognizes there is no previously constructed foundation per se, but rather a subsequent recovery that celebrates its own contingency. Thus conversion is the radical change in the for itself's relationship with itself. The subject remains the moral center of gravity, but not, but not because of its internal life, because of its reaching towards the outside as a world choice. It is for this reason that Sartre's moral is a fresh proposal in the field of contemporary moral theories. Its difficulty lies in his ambiguous standpoint on a non-objective and non-necessarily intersubjective value and on the possibility of justifying the choices of absolute freedom. There is no universal principle guiding individual moral choices. What we have is the gratuitous recovery of our own choices by taking responsibility totally and radically for them. We cannot base our decisions on a deontological set or on a rational calculation, and not even on the identification of virtues, which are nothing more than essences in bad faith. So, the most problematic question concerns the possibility of raising a moral that is unquestionably and unshakably the fruit of a subjective and personal choice to a degree of universality capable of building a supra-historical framework for the evaluation of human actions. However, as we will attempt to show in the final part of this paper, Sartrean freedom is not truly left to a voluntaristic whim, but perhaps can be detected in an impl implicit normative principle within freedom itself. To further clarify the distance between Sartrean moral and Kantian and Hegelian thought, it should be sufficient to mention the only great regulator of action positively recognized by Sartre, one which would justify the concrete, albeit temporary, adoption of a revolutionary socialist moral. The definition together with the human group of oppressed of a good in the light of which evil manifests as evil. What we have here is an appeal to the only human social group able to conceive an ethics, able to emancipate itself from violence, experience it on their own skin. No historical progress has the power to redeem the individual body's pain. Sartre will assert that because one cannot save children from suffering, while history may have a direction, it does not have a meaning. All we can do is to concretely reduce the amount of suffering. As in the invective Ivan Karamazov addresses to God and to a vision of history where everything has dialectical meaning, even pain and destruction, the issue of children's pain that can in no way be redeemed against returns here. The reality of suffering, the physical image of oppression, lives with the need to be removed. However, to carry out this type of operation, we have to presuppose ways of welcoming the other that can overcome the dynamics of objectification and alienation presented thus far and instead constitute the concrete attitudes of the model of conversion. The existential attitude allowing access to the other from moral conversion is the appeal, defined as, quote, the recognition of a personal freedom in situation by a personal freedom in situation, end of quote in what is no longer a hierarchical relationship, but now egalitarian. If the subject is what is in the form of what it is not yet, 
in other words, in the form of the freely said have to be, he is first of all a project. And this is why acknowledgement of the other is principally understanding their ends through existential psychoanalysis, which, however, is not explicitly mentioned in this instance. The appeal makes help and willingness possible. The principle of willingness is that, quote, every end is good as a future realization of value until the contrary is demonstrated, end of quote. It is possible to choose whether to facilitate the other's actions without having to betray or sacrifice one's own projects. In addition, the other's project is absolutely conditioned to the extent that it could be modified at the moment of encounter through an inverse and unexpected revelation. One has to want it to be precisely the other to achieve one's end, to avoid ending in the failure of his venture. In this sense, the appeal is precisely a refusal to transcend ends, be they one's own or the other's. Beyond the yoke of oppression, which assigns specific social roles, the other is no longer the hellish look that sanctions or judges, but becomes identified as freedom in difficulty. For ends to be understood, it is imperative to go beyond the abstract encounter of two looks to meet uh, the other in all its incarnated freedom. Therefore, quote, one will love the goldness, the nervousness of this politician or that doctor who pushes aside and overcomes this thin, nervous body and forget it. For it is made to be forgotten by him, and for rediscovering itself transposed into his work, yet, on the contrary, to be thematized or objectified by me. This vulnerability, this finitude, is the body. End of quote. The positive and authentic answer to the appeal is generosity, whose specific maxim of action is simultaneously formal and concrete. Quote, As for the basis of my choice to help him, it is now clear that the world have an infinity of free and finite features each of which is directly projected by a free will and indirectly upheld by the willing of all others in that each wants the concrete freedom of the other, that is, does not want it in its abstract form of universality, but on the contrary, in its concrete and limited form. Such is the maxim of my action. To want, to want a value to be realized, not because it is mine, not because it is a value, but because it is a value for someone on earth. End of quote. Saul takes the need for concreteness in this maxim so seriously that it is with regret he admits this appeal structure cannot be easily extended to just anyone. It will more likely for this to occur amongst individuals in the same social class and of the same nationality and life conditions. This impedes its universal adoption, which would allow to the creation of a collective we that could truly break the chains of alienation. What the appeal and generosity structure may limit itself to doing, for now, in this situation, is to constitute isolated archipelagos of freedoms. Generosity at the apex of subjective and personal values for Sartre is very different from the concept of law, as expounded in being and nothingness. In the dimension of generosity, Sartre takes up his analysis of love again, this time purged of any psychological dynamics. Here love is a tension suspended between being and willing to be, an ambiguity that turns the morphology of acting into becoming and rejects the essential petrification of the sentiment. Sentiments are ventures which are affirmed by their being questioned. Conscious love is no longer a failure to meet the other. It is no reified tension. Love is not a psychic experience but a self-questioning enacted by itself. Quote, so in love itself, at its heart, there will be, if it is authentic, this being or not being, and does a fundamental anxiety that is love may not be. And just as love is willed at the same time that is felt, this anxiety too must be willed in authenticity as our own defense against future. Not that our future freedom comes to us like a thief who will destroy everything, but rather that we shall be for this freedom whatever form the past will take, whose meaning I will decide upon. So we discover a new tension at the heart of our authenticity. End of quote. Authentic love is the joy beyond any attempt to appropriate the other, who is, on the contrary, generously, generously revealed as freedom and surpassed in the direction of his own previously understood and accepted ends. Generosity is a value that I have to be put for words. It is a project living in a state of tension, a proposal to establish immediate relationships with others and with the world through its actions, but never a fully constituted or formed beingness. Pinning down the original and ontological character of the dynamics of alienation and generosity is most certainly a problematical issue. <laughs> 
Sartre is very explicit in declaring that the primary relationship with the other is alienation, an ontological form of conduct that already finds itself in the world of the primitive man's desire through his bond with nature, well before any techno-economical inventions. A criticism of During and Engels can be clearly perceived here. Generosity is therefore the practical possibility at a subsequent stage which man can in freedom choose to break the originary vicious circle that diminishes freedom as its own internal destiny. It is not by chance that for Sartre freedom is tragic, and for this reason its ratio cognoscendi is ethical anguish. Nonetheless, to make this alternative possible, we would have to presuppose that even generosity, despite being a possibility and not a destiny, is originally and ethically de jure, even if ultimately not de facto. If freedom produces its own chains to hold it down, it is possible to conceive that the same freedom can lead to a principle for being exercised correctly. We can at this stage suspect that Sartre had something of a principle of practical non-contradiction of freedom in mind. Indeed, he presents generosity as the peak of subjective value, which approaches the most absolute freedom like an, asy like an asymptote approaches a line. Even if generosity seems to present itself as a pure alternative to the ethics of force, we can nevertheless go further and take it to mean a normative explanation of the right use of freedom, or an, or an expression of a freedom that, as reaffirmed in the concept of almost creation that follows on form it, aims to enrich itself and share itself out, instead of diminishing into the various ruinous projects of mystification, oppression and flight from the anxiety of its own unjustifiability. In this instance, generosity seems to present itself as the maximum degree of power in the exercise of freedom. If ontological freedom is in fact indisputable, as we have seen, it is the very subject who diminishes the radical power of their own expression, deceiving themselves that they have to correspond to some right, obligation or duty, or believing they can ineluctably identify themselves with a character or a destiny. If instead... Freedom is understood within the frame of its absolutely radical nature. The only way to avoid contradiction is by recovering oneself as freedom as well as recovering others as freedom too. We can't say that we are passing from a purely ontological conception of freedom to a moral conception of freedom. At this stage, if we apply this sort of principle of practical non-contradiction of freedom with Sartre, we can confidently assert that freedoms mutually sustain each other, and that on a normative level, we can do away with all existential projects which make an attempt on the other freedom. The generous man is the man who has understood his personal freedom, as well as others, and respects both, without transcending either his own ends or those of others. Nevertheless, even if we accept such a practical principle of non-contradiction, which tells freedom how to correctly exercise itself beyond all its mystifications, the problem of the plane of justification remains. Sartre writes, quote, I have no right whatsoever to will what I will, and what I will confers no right upon me. Yet I'm justified in willing it, because I will to will what I will. What are the conditions under which it can be possible to will one's own will? We simply find ourselves faced with a tautological assertion. However, even though Sartre does not develop this saying, it is possible to assert that the doubling up of willing to will what that which is will, sorry, involves questioning the project of the for itself through the pure reflection that contingently recovers it and with the awareness of, a, of its own gratuitousness. It is clear Sartre does not want to suggest any a priori principles, not even a supra-historical principle that would guarantee the critical exercise over history. Nonetheless, willing to will one's own will reintroduces a sort of normative foundation in the pure position of the will. To will one's own will, it is necessary to have interrogated it. If this happens without the pretext of any right whatsoever, Sartre seems to say that it is therefore not a project of violence, obligation or imposition, but one stemming from the comprehension of one's own as well as the other's finitude. With pure reflection, we are not defined by what we believe we are, which is only the internalization of the other's look and therefore alienation, but by what we desire, which is the existentially thematized and questioned. However, the principle of practical non-contradiction is a principle of self-determination of the will. Here the references certainly can't, but we can adapt it to the Sartrean conception of concrete universal, 
a will that self-determinates itself in 1947 would not have the same reasons and justifications of another will some centuries before. Nevertheless, it remains a criterion that transcends history, because it must always be possible to opt for a critical perspective towards reality. This principle implies the reflective ability that Sartre recognizes in, in the pure reflection, to which it is possible to trace, at least the jure, a correct exercise of will and freedom. Just as in the second formulation of the Kantian categorical imperative, Sartre calls us to act so as to treat the other and oneself never merely as a means to an end, but always and simultaneously as an end in itself. The fact that you can become an object through the other's look is not in, its, in itself a danger. It becomes a danger only if the other refuses to also see freedom in this object. Quote, so the being of the other is my affair. But furthermore, if I want a project to be realized by a man, this is because I want it to be a victor over fragility. So I assume this fragility. It becomes precious. In the terms of, of classical ethics, I will say that it has a value. End of quote. This other should not be taken to mean abstract and general humanity, but rather the individual, a contingent body, in this specific historical era, with its own means, obstacles and ends. Sartre believe it is possible to choose to become an attempt at recovery and support. This project of care, which surely recalls Heidegger's thought, primarily caters to the other's body, which now reveals itself as a material expression of freedom. Quote, but with this, my freedom also has a face. It is this outline of action in the universe, therefore this body, this ignorance, this risk. End of quote. The example Sartre proposes is to watch a man from behind. You can see what the other can see or foresee. Unlike the direct conflict between looks in ego, here we have a different outlook on the other, now seen not so much in his infernal power to objectify, but rather in the fragility of his finitude, exposed to risk and danger. Conversely, the other can also perceive me as a freedom in difficulty that could be hidden for the failure of its project in a mutual revelation of personal limitations. In what is almost a lyrical passage, Sartre rules out any possibility of criticizing his thought as Platonism regarding his conception of freedom, claiming that freedom cannot be directly lovable, for it is nothing more than negation and productivity, as well as pure being in its exteriority of indifference. What is really lovable with immediate intentionality is the other's body, insofar as it is freedom in the dimension of being. Quote, this vulnerability, this finitude, is the body, the body for others. To unveil the other in his being within the world is to love him in his body. End of quote. This mutual recognition of freedoms, forms of, uh, forms of absolute gratuitousness that can choose to support each other, primarily implies a previously unseen comprehension and generosity in deciding to be the guardian of the other's finitude. This attitude fulfills a tangible project to look after the body and liberate it from oppression for the reason that the body is the concrete, personal and situated face of freedom. Thank you.